Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Welcome to all of you to Rockefeller University. One of the things we tell our students is you learn science by doing science. So today is your opportunity to do some science, visit the stations, get your hands involved in experiments, and I, I hope you'll learn something and really, more importantly, enjoy your visit today. So before you do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit, bit about what I'm really interested in, and that, that is viruses, okay? So let's begin with a question, what is a virus? A virus is a very simple entity. Here is a picture of the virus that I spend most of my time working on. It's called human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, as I'll call it. This is a picture taken in an electron microscope, very powerful kind of microscope. And then this is a cartoon. So what is a virus? A virus is defined by its components. So a key part of the virus is genetic material. DNA, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, or its close relative, another molecule called RNA. That genetic material is surrounded by viral proteins. Typically, some of those proteins will assemble to protect the genetic material in a, a structure that we call the capsid. Now, in addition, some viruses have a skin, an outer fatty layer that we call an envelope. Some, but not all viruses, have that. Now, one question that's kind of a little bit controversial in science, are viruses alive? Are they living things or not? So the, the real answer to that is kind of, sort of, OK? They have some of the characteristics of living things, but not all. So they have genetic material. They can replicate, that is, make copies of them, themselves. When they do that, it's not 100% accurate. So they can change over time. And because of that, they can evolve through natural selection. And there's a station here at Science Saturday that's all about evolution. Go and visit that, and you can learn about that topic. But viruses don't have some of the key features that living things that we encounter in our everyday lives have. They're not made of cells that grow and divide in the way that you are, for example. And they don't do chemistry, at least not by themselves. They don't metabolize food. They don't use energy or generate energy. So they're kind of in this meh zone between living and non-living. You can, in fact, think of a virus in sort of the same way as you think of the seeds of a plant. By themselves, they don't really do anything, but you give them soil and water, then you get a living organism. And what viruses need to grow, to live, in a sense, is a host cell. And so this is the replication cycle of the virus that I particularly work on. And what happens is that a virus approaches, attaches to a cell, and then enters it. In the case of this virus, its skin fuses with the outer membrane of the cell, and the insides of the virus, including its genetic material, are delivered to the cell. Then once inside the cell, the virus genetic material replicates, sometimes using its own machinery, sometimes using machinery provided by the cell. The virus convinces the cell to make new copies of viral genetic material and viral proteins. Those assemble together and then leave the cell as new virus particles. Now, the key feature is one virus coming into one cell can generate many, many viruses coming out. So for example, in the virus that I study, HIV-1, a person gets infected by one single infectious virus. Two weeks later, their body is full of billions of viruses. So it's an amplification as well as a replication process. So this is actually a movie of viruses leaving a cell. This sort of ghostly white, um, figure that you can see in the background is a cell. And we have labeled one of the virus proteins with something that's fluorescent. So you can see that diffuse in the background. And then the, the proteins come together to make these virus particles. This was actually the first ever movie made of a, a cell generating virus particles in living cells in real time. That was done here by my lab and my colleague Sandy Simon working together. OK, 
So that's one virus. Viruses actually come in many different shapes and sizes. Here's a cartoon representation of many viruses. Some of them you'll have heard of. This big snake-like one is called Ebola, very deadly. Rabies, also quite deadly. Measles, been in the news recently, and HIV-1. Many, many types of virus, some quite common, some quite rare. Here are pictures of real viruses. So this is a tiny virus called parvovirus. Many of you will have encountered that before. HIV-1, and this is what we call a giant virus, pithovirus, that infects amoeba. So it's a giant among viruses, but this scale by here is 200 nanometers. That is about one thousandth of the thickness of a human cell. So that gives you an idea of how small these giant viruses are and how really small these tiny viruses are. So what I'm going to do now is show you a few little movies of what happens to cells when they become infected by viruses. So on the left, what you'll see is a view down a microscope of a layer of cells growing on a plastic dish. And what we've done is infect these cells with viruses that carry a fluorescent protein gene. This is actually a gene from a jellyfish that makes a protein that glows green when we shine a laser on it. And you're going to see that view on the right here. And so in this case, one cell gets infected, it divides, and then the virus spreads to neighboring cells. As the cells grow and divide, the virus spreads from cell to cell. But what I want you to notice is the cells are quite happy. Nothing really bad is happening to those cells. You can't tell the difference between an infected and an uninfected cell in this view. It's only by seeing where the virus is here that you can tell that those cells are actually infected. Very different situation here. This is a virus that really kills cells. Okay, so you can see the virus spreading from the middle here. The cells, when they become infected, they round up and die. And by the end of this movie, which is actually about one day compressed into a few seconds, all the cells in this culture have been killed. Other viruses, cause cells to fuse together. This is one such virus, and you can see this layer of cells starting to fuse together as the virus spreads through them. So the point here is that viruses have very different effects on the different kinds of cells that they infect. They also infect um, very different uh, types of cells. And it's really that feature that determines what the effects are on a host. What happens to a person, an animal, a plant, when they become infected? What determines whether a virus causes disease or not? Now, who in this room today has a viral infection? Anybody? Anybody? A few. You are correct. Everyone who has their hands down Sorry, but you got that question wrong. <laughs> C, yes, exactly. Um, we all carry viruses all the time, many viruses. But most viruses do not make us sick. Most viruses, we don't know that they're carrying them. And there are a couple of reasons behind that. One of them I'll tell you about now. So the effect of a virus really depends on how many cells are infected, um, what type of cells they are, um, and what happens to those cells when they're infected. As I've just shown you, sometimes the cells die and sometimes they don't. So let's talk a little bit in that now about a few viral diseases. Okay, this is norovirus. Anyone heard of norovirus? Yes, a few of you. So this is norovirus. The cells it likes to infect are the cells that line your gut. Now, there's a reason why this picture is brown. <laughs> this is actually a picture of somebody's poop. And it's got lots of norovirus, because this is what norovirus does. Okay. So if you've ever had a really bad stomach ache, bit of fever, throwing up, Diarrhea, sometimes both at the same time, that's really bad. 
That's norovirus, okay? Most people will encounter norovirus, particularly in New York City. Very, very common, okay? It makes you feel terrible, but in a couple of days you recover. Now, the next virus I'll tell you about is transmitted, or at least was transmitted, in more or less the same way, but sometimes had very much more serious outcome. This is a virus called poliovirus. Again, replicates in mostly in the cells lining the gut, but for most people doesn't make them sick. But for a few people, this virus learns the trick to leave the gut and replicate in cells we call neurons. These are the cells in our brains, the cells that transmit messages around the body. And in some cases, this virus causes paralysis. So this is a picture taken from the earlier part of last century, about 60 or 70 years ago. And what these structures are, are what we call iron lungs. Because this virus can cause paralysis, people were not able to breathe by themselves. And so to survive, they were placed inside this airtight chamber and the pressure was increased and decreased to pull air in and out of the lungs, okay? That was really the only way that they could breathe. So most people would recover from this paralysis, but for some people, the paralysis, particularly in the limbs, would become permanent. And so these are children from not that long ago, a few decades ago, that are survivors of poliovirus and they have lower limb paralysis, muscle wasting, and really lifelong disability from this viral infection. So poliovirus is largely a thing of the past. This is a virus that currently kills the most people in the world, human immunodeficiency virus, which causes AIDS. This virus infects cells of the immune system. It kills those cells, and it really strongly impairs our ability to mount immune responses, and so infections that we would normally very easily fight off become life-threatening. And so this chap, who has clearly had many such infections over a period of years, his immune system's collapsed and he is clearly going to die uh, from this disease. Currently in the world, there are 37 million people infected with HIV. About 2 million people get infected every year we actually have quite good, actually very good medicines to treat this virus, but we just simply don't have the ability or the will to get those medicines to everybody that needs it. And so currently about one million people die from this virus every year. Okay, serious stuff. Okay, so let's go back a little bit to some virus biology. Um, the effect of viruses on host is sometimes bad, very rarely is it good. And so evolution through natural selection has endowed us with mechanisms to fight back against viruses. Our cells strike back. And this is one of the things that I particularly work on. Okay, so cells make proteins whose major and probably only job is to interfere with the replication of viruses. I'm just going to tell you about one of these. There are probably hundreds of such uh, antiviral proteins that we make to kill viruses. One that we discovered a few years ago is a protein called tetherin. This protein sits on the outer membrane of cells. And when viruses try to leave that cell, tetherin grabs the virus and stops it from going off to infect new cells. And so if you look in the microscope, what happens there, here's a cell infected by a virus where there's no tetherin. You can see a few virus particles on its surface. The rest have gone off to infect new cells. If you have tetherin on the surface of the cell, then those particles all get trapped on the surface. They can't go off and infect new cells, and you can stop the virus infection. Now, the problem is viruses also evolve by natural selection, and they evolve faster than hosts, typically. And so it turns out that many viruses have proteins whose only job is to get rid of tetherin, okay? So we make a defense, the viruses make a counter defense, and this type of evolutionary battle 
Rebels versus empire has gone on for hundreds of millions of years. So we have hundreds of defenses and viruses have hundreds of ways to defeat those defenses. And who wins that battle largely determines whether you become infected or you become sick from virus infections. Okay, there's a really, another really important way that we can protect ourselves against viruses. And this is our immune systems, our adaptive immune systems. And I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about how a particularly important component of our adaptive immune system works. So in our bodies, we have cells called B cells, okay? We have billions of different B cells. And each B cell is different because it has a different molecule on its surface called a B cell receptor. Billions of different ones, okay? And so when a virus comes along, one or a few of those B cells can recognize it. Their receptor actually binds directly to that virus, okay? When that happens, this binding event sends a signal to this B cell. It tells the B cell, grow and divide, grow and divide. And when you've grown and divided for a little while, stop growing and dividing and release these molecules into the circulation. And these molecules are what we call antibodies. Antibodies are a very important defense because they can recognize virus particles. When a virus comes along, the antibody coats the virus particle and stops it from being able to infect cells. Antibodies do something else as well. If you have a few infected cells, if so, a few viruses escape, the antibodies come and coat the infected cell and tell other cells of the immune system to come and kill and eat this cell. There's a virus inside it. And that's exactly what happens. And this is part of how we recover from virus infections. Now, we can also trick our immune systems into providing a defense against viruses. And that's what we do with vaccines, okay? So when you get a shot, a vaccine, usually what you're getting, whoops. Oh, we're back. <laughs> you either receiving a weakened virus, a dead virus, or sometimes just a little piece of a virus. And your B cell can't tell the difference between the, the nasty virus and the vaccine. So it grows and divides, grows and divides, makes antibodies, okay? And you do that without ever having seen the real virus. But then when the real virus comes along, you already have the antibodies on board that mop up the virus, kill any virus infected cells, and you will never know that you were even exposed to the virus, okay? This has been an astonishingly important aspect of modern human health, okay? This virus, smallpox virus, one of the biggest, probably the biggest, the biggest infectious disease killer in human history. Hundreds of millions of people have died from this virus. Here's a picture of the virus. This is what it does to you, not just on the outside, but on the inside as well. A very lethal virus. Now, around the time I was born, the year before I was born, 10 million people in the world were infected by smallpox and 2 million people died. We've had a vaccine for this virus for many years. In fact, this was the first vaccine ever made. But in 1967, the World Health Organization said, look, we have a virus, we have a vaccine. This virus is still killing people. We need to do something about this. We have the tools. Let's start a mass vaccination campaign they did exactly that, vaccinated many, many millions of people around the world. And 10 years later, the last person in the world to die of smallpox died. So in 1978, there were zero cases of smallpox. And in 1980, smallpox was declared eradicated. The most lethal killer of humans in history, gone. So now we don't even need to take a smallpox shot. We have a somewhat similar situation with polio virus, although we're not quite done with polio. 
So I told you about what polio used to do in the early part of last century. But in the 1950s, a vaccine was developed and introduced. And you can see the deaths from polio virus decreased to almost zero. And they've been very low for a long time. Now, these days, only a few people in the world get polio virus every year. And we're just in the last stages of trying to mop up this virus. Because some of these infections occur in war zones, um, it's been quite difficult to, to really put the end to this virus. And one thing that's also causing us problems is that um, there has recently, it's become popular to say that, well, I don't need to take vaccines anymore. I'm not going to bother vaccinating uh, my family. And this is quite frustrating to uh, scientists like me. We spend our lives trying to develop vaccines that can prevent viral diseases. And if they're not used, then viruses like this come back. So this is a virus that's been in the news recently, measles virus. 20 years ago, there was no measles in the United States. Now there are hundreds of cases of measles because certain people in our community choose not to vaccinate. This is a highly infectious virus. Uh, usually one recovers, but sometimes it can cause very debilitating and lethal infections. It's incumbent on us not to vaccinate ourselves, not just to protect ourselves, but to protect other people, people who either haven't yet or cannot uh, take the vaccines. There are a few people who, who can't be immunized um, early in life. So the message I would leave you with is get your shots, kids. It's important not just for your health, but for the health of other people as well. So that's the message I want to leave you with. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I want to thank the people that I work with. Um, this is my team here. Head of that team, the person that leads it with me, is my wife, Theodora. She's here in the room. And here she is last year at, Science Saturday, at the Science Saturday event. I have a wonderful team of colleagues that join me in working on understanding and trying to defeat viruses, who I'd like to thank very much. And these are my two kids, Stefan and Eve, who I'd like to thank for helping me choose what to put in this presentation. And thank you very much for listening.